Hello everyone and welcome to another BDO International Tax Webinar. Today's webinar is going to be focused on the US tax reform. My name is Malcolm Joy. I'm an international partner in BDO's London office in the UK and I'll be chairing today's webinar. Just a few bits of housekeeping before we start. This webinar uses audio broadcast technology. The sound will come through the speakers on your laptop. Now, occasionally we do get some people experiencing difficulty with the sound if they are in areas with limited broadband. Uh, but if that is the case, then the, there is the uh, facility to dial in using your phone and listen to the webinar. Dial in details can be requested by clicking on the phone and question mark symbol on the right hand side of the screen. CP certificates are available for US attendees. To qualify for the certificate, you'll need to answer at least four of the five pop-up questions, which will appear periodically throughout the webinar. You'll also need to be logged on to the webinar for the whole duration, and the certificates will then be emailed to you within six weeks of the webinar. Copies of slides from today's webinar will be sent out to everyone who has registered together with a link to the recording, and this should be sent out early next week. We will aim to leave some time at the end of the webinar for questions. If you would like to submit a question uh, during the webinar, then please use the Q&A facility on the right-hand side of the screen. And please remember to submit your questions to all panelists. If we don't get time to answer the questions, then we will get back to you shortly after the webinar. So, for many years, we've been accustomed to a US tax system which broadly works for international businesses as follows. For the high federal rate of tax, there have been a number of significant deductions and allowances. And we've had a worldwide tax regime for US-based multinationals. They've been taxed on profits made anywhere in the world, but with a tax credit given for the foreign taxes paid. However, profits kept outside the US may escape the US tax charge until they are remitted. As a consequence of the high tax rate, groups have often sought to limit the amounts of profits attributable to the US, and US-based multinationals have made efforts to keep the profits overseas. We've had debt pushdowns and cross-border financing as ways to manage the profit allocation within a group. And US tax reform has often been talked about, but successive regimes in the US have struggled to bring about any fundamental reforms. In the meantime, the rest of the world has largely moved to regimes involving lower tax rates and territorial systems, leaving the U.S. looking more and more isolated. Well, is this about to change? So, and U.S. tax reform is undoubtedly the main area of interest in the world of international tax at the moment. It hasn't quite knocked Prince Harry and Meghan Markle off the front pages of the news in the U.K. at least, but it is the non nonetheless very newsworthy. And I'm delighted to have with me four distinguished colleagues from BDO in the US who will guide us through the latest developments and the practical implications for businesses. Monica Loving, Todd Simmons, Ben Willis, and Joe Caliano. Todd will take a look at the legislative process that is required for tax reform to be enacted. Ben will explain the implications for shareholders and domestic corporations. Joe will take a look at the international aspects and also guide us through the differences between the two different versions of the bill that are out there at present, the House version and the Senate version. And finally, I will be talking to Monica about the practical implications for international businesses. This is an international tax webinar with more than half of the audience based outside the US, so we will aim to keep this webinar at a level which is accessible to tax and finance people around the world, and not just for those who already have a detailed knowledge of the US tax code. So, Todd. As of 11.05 Eastern on Thursday, the 30th of November, where are we on the legislative reform process? Well, thank you, Malcolm, and good day, everyone. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about where we are in the process, and I thought it would be helpful before we get into some of the details and implications of the provisions to give a little bit of a background on how legislation moves through Congress. I spent three years with Congress's Joint Committee on Taxation, which is charged with, first of all, being the official revenue scorekeeper for tax legislation. So when they say that the bill costs $1.5 trillion, it's because the Joint Committee on Taxation, after its analysis, indicates that it does. Um, they're also charged with writing committee reports and legislative history that we'll see come out as the process unfolds. Now, all bills for raising revenue, taxation bills, have to start in the House of Representatives, and that's why you've seen the House already pass its bill. What we're hearing now is the Senate's got uh, its version, 
Uh, in fact, I think they've begun a debate today with a hope to vote on that bill tomorrow. Um, as we'll talk about in a little bit, there's some uncertainty as to where some Republican members of the Senate um, are on the bill. Now, individual members of the House and Senate can always prepare um, bills throughout the process right now. This, um, while it's on the Senate floor, senators um, can raise amendments. There's a robust amendment process when it's on the Senate floor. It's a little bit different from the House. So senators can raise amendments. They generally need to have ways to pay for their amendments if they raise revenue as the process unfolds. The House Committee on Ways and Means and the Senate Committee on Finance are each responsible for proposals and for considering tax legislation on their end. Um, they are marked up by committee. So we would hear that the House Ways and Means Committee marked a bill up that the full House considered Senate Finance has finished its work and it's now at the full Senate floor. Staff are also, also have a very prominent role. Staff from the Joint Committee on Taxation and the Treasury Department also have a role in shaping the way legislation comes out, explaining to members what changes to legislation would do, and assisting in drafting the text of legislative changes. Once the House has voted on a package and the full Senate has voted on a package, they'll each have generally two separate bills. So a conference committee will be appointed by House and Senate leadership to reconcile the two bills and come up with one package. That bill will then be voted on once again by the full House and the full Senate and then that bill, if there is one, uh, as a result of that process, will be sent to the president's desk for signature. So that's the process that we're looking for right now. And right now we're at, this, we're at the, the part where the Senate is considering its legislative package. Um, then they have to go through the whole process again, which will again uh, raise other challenges as they go through. Next slide, please. So right now, here's the split of Congress as of middle of the month. Um, the Republicans have a slightly larger majority in the House of Representatives. The Senate has a rather thin majority. You have two independent senators who caucus with Democrats. So essentially, you've got a 52-48 split in the Senate. Um, that raises some challenges for getting legislation passed through the Senate um, for two uh, for two reasons. First of all, um, you may have senators that have philosophical senators in the majority party with philosophical issues with legislation. So their vote is not necessarily a guarantee. But in this instance, um, one senator could actually filibuster legislation generally. And if they filibuster, that generally means that they can kill a bill. They can hold it up. Only if 60 senators then vote to end the filibuster, they vote for cloture on the bill, will the bill then continue to proceed? Now, if this moved along as a tax bill, a general tax bill, um, there are not 60 senators in support of the bill to invoke cloture where they would continue to move it on. So what the Senate has done this time, like they did in 2001, is they're moving this tax package through the budget reconciliation process. By doing so, the limitations, however, are that the tax package cannot increase the deficit outside of the 10-year budget window. What that essentially means is none of the tax decreases can be effective outside the 10-year budget window. The upside is that rather than needing 60 votes to invoke cloture, <laughs> only 51 votes are needed to approve the bill. So they're able to get a bill pr approved with 51 votes. In a worst case scenario, that can mean 50 votes in favor, 50 against, and the Vice President of the United States will come in and under the Constitution will split the tie. And in this case, we would expect the Vice President to come in in favor of the package. That's a worst case scenario in passage. Next slide, please. So as I mentioned, the Senate um, is, is an interesting place. That's where things get, get, um, get rather interesting. No, no better word than that. Um, here's a list of Republican senators that we're watching. Um, as I indicated before, um, some senators may have philosophical issues with legislation. And this is no different. We'll go through these senators just to give you an idea of where they are and perhaps where there has been some compromise. Okay. Well, Ron Johnson of Wisconsin has already indicated no for the bill. He has concerns about the pass-through provisions. He wants to see um, more robust provisions benefiting smaller pass-through businesses. 
They're still negotiating that. Susan Collins of Maine, if you recall, when the health care bill did not pass the Senate, it's because Susan Collins, Lisa Murkowski, and John McCain had each voted no, bringing the yeses down to 49. The vice president could not break a tie in that case. Those three are on this list again. Susan Collins is concerned about including the Obamacare tax repeal in the Senate's version of the bill. They would bring down to zero the rate of the Obamacare penalty tax. Um, the reason for including that is it is estimated to raise about $340 billion through um, the government being relieved of subsidies and Medicare and Medicaid um, relief, et cetera, to the government. And using that money to pay to make just the corporate tax rate reduction permanent, everything else would be the 10-year, as I mentioned, it would be subject to 10 years and then everything would revert back. The only provision that would be permanent would be the, ten the corporate tax rate. And that subsidy is just to pay for that. That bothers Senator Collins. It also bothers um, Senator Jerry Moran of Kansas. He's concerned about removing that tax as well. Um, worried about the impact on Medicare and Medicaid. That's, that's something very important to them. So they're still trying to work out issues. Now, Senator Collins also has been reported to have some concerns about repealing the state and local income tax deduction. Um, there's talk about bringing back a property tax deduction on the Senate bill, which is in the House version. So that may get her more comfortable. Bob Corker and Jeff Flake um, are each retiring. I will tell you, retiring senators um, are beholden to no one, and they are less inclined to feel that they have to be in step with their party. They're also both concerned about the tax package's impact on the deficit. Um, they, are, they did approve, however, I think they're both on the Budget Committee, which approved two days ago the, com the, the, the bill out of committee so they could move to the floor. But despite their approval, they still have concerns. They are looking for language in the bill that would actually say something like, if the bill doesn't stir up the economy or raise revenue or do the things that, that, that's being touted uh, out in public, that somehow it would shut off the tax cuts. They're looking for something like that. Steve Daines of Montana, like Ron Johnson, is concerned about the impact on small pastors. He's looking for more benefits for them. James Lankford of Oklahoma is also concerned about the impact on the deficit. As I mentioned, John McCain, another wild card like he was in the health care um, legislation that, that did not pass the Senate, is concerned about the deficit. John McCain is likely not going to be running again. He has some medical issues. Um, and as he showed us during health care, he could be a wild card. He could show up on the Senate floor and vote one way or the other, and no one really know. We talked about Jerry Moran. He's got concerns about Obamacare tax repeal, also the deficit, and he has a specific concern about a tuition waiver provision. Lisa Murkowski of Alaska, I had, I had thought she would be concerned about the Obamacare tax repeal, but she has come out okay with that. She feels folks should not be forced to have to enter the medical, the health care marketplace. But she has not offered full support for the bill. She's another senator to watch. Both Mike Lee and Marco Rubio wanted to see an increase in the child tax credit, which they got. It's now on the Senate version, $2,000. Marco Rubio, just as early as this morning, was reported as looking to make that child credit fully refundable. Right now, it's not a fully refundable credit. He wants it to be fully refundable. And he's looking to take the 20% corporate rate that's, being, that's in both bills and increasing it to pay for making the child credit refundable. So there's sort of the landscape of the questionable senators. Um, there's not many legislative days left in 2017. You can see the House has about 10, the Senate 12. That does make things challenging to get things fixed, because what they have ahead of them now is the Senate needs to vote on the bill. They have to make sure they have 50 senators tomorrow, if that's when they're going to vote. And then they've got to go through conference all before the legislative days are end for the holidays. There are still a lot of distractions, both in the, in the administration and in the Congress. That tends to slow momentum down. There has been a sluggish momentum legislatively all year in getting things passed. This is no different. We've gone through the Senate rules. We're still looking at a 10-year package. Um, and uh, oh, I, I should tell you that just across my, my iPhone, John McCain is supporting the tax bill. He just came out publicly supporting it. So you can put him in the yes column. Um, from what I just went over. So there's another senator now in favor. That will likely move things toward the Senate passing. Um, tax legislation is complex. It takes a while to pass. 
if things move into 2018, if they're not able to get a, a bill agreed to and, and, and um, a conference report agreed to and the President's desk by New Year's, 2018 will slow things down again. It is an election year. It is a midterm election year. Things start all over again in January, um, whether it's a new Congress or otherwise. And it will start to slow things. Folks will start to talk to constituents more. They'll start to rethink things. So I think um, there's really a push to try to get things uh, done by the end of the year. Malcolm. Thanks, sir, Todd, and thanks for the, uh, the very real-time update on uh, uh, Senator McCain's intentions on the voting there. That's uh, very interesting. It's interesting as well to see the results of the polling question that we put up there. Uh, with nearly 60% of the respondents to that first polling question saying they do expect tax reform to be passed in the near future. Is, is that in line with your views as, as well, Todd? Do you think it is more likely than not that we're going to get this reform through the system? Well, every day as we start to see those, those known on the fence senators coming around, I do think that there's a pretty good chance that something will be presented to the president. The question, though, Malcolm, is what it's going to look like. Because remember that although we know that, that the Senate is going to be agreeing on a bill, and, and the Senate will likely pass its bill tomorrow, I think it looks like they will, the, the issue is there's, there's a few places where they do really differ from the House. One is repealing the estate and generation skipping transfer taxes. The House would. The Senate would not. The Obamacare tax repeal, the Senate would, would repeal it. The House would not. Um, and there's a few other provisions. Um, the, the way you deal with corporate pastors, the, the House would, re, would reduce the rate that individuals pick up past their income to 25%. The Senate would have a 17.4% deduction. Those are going to be the things to watch because that process could add or lose senators as they go forward. Okay. Interesting uh Interesting analysis there. Thank you very much for that, Todd. We are going to move now on to uh, Ben, who is going to talk about the uh, domestic and uh, domestic corporate and shareholder uh, implications of the uh, of the proposed bill. Thank you, Malcolm. This is Ben. I uh, I'm going to go ahead and start off with a, a high level overview of some of the changes made to. Uh, the corporate provisions, uh, non-international corporate provisions, and w with one overarching theme, which is they're trying to, as we know, improve the competitiveness of corporations uh, domestically and, and throughout uh, the world. Um, the biggest way to do that is cut the, the weight, and that's the largest cut that we see here, this the biggest change, going from 35 to 20 percent tax rate is a, obviously a, a massive deal. And, and in fact, there are some other businesses, uh, large partnerships, S corporations, who have already spoken up against it, saying that they're, they may be no longer as competitive with uh, corporations as they once were. And in fact, uh, Senator John Cornyn got quoted just the other day saying that uh, this is a concern of his. He's uh, been reached out to by several partnerships, and they're continuing to take a look at the benefits that uh, domestic corporations are, are getting through this package. Um, in other words, they're, they're getting a lot. This is a, a big giveaway for corporations that may change the landscape for how we're all looking at what entities we're going to be dealing with in the future. and. Uh, and when we're going to be utilized. And so um, that, that's an overview of, of our, our first slide. I wanted to just highlight a couple other uh, points before we switch on over. Obviously, the 20% rate is a big deal. That's in the first bullet. Uh, the first bullet under individuals, you'll see the capital gain rates are uh, 0, 15, and 20. That depends on your income tax bracket. And so whether it's 15 or 20, if you have a lot of income, um, that's the max rate. And the AMT uh, would be repealed. So we'll circle back to how capital gains tied to the lower corporate tax rate could have a, a, a large impact overall, um, in, in other words, in, indirectly on its shareholders. And then we have uh, some provisions that relate to pass-through entities uh, that Jeff uh, will, see, will be uh, talking about and we'll be getting uh, some more uh, discussion on later on. 
in a in a separate webcast, but it's important here to mention that uh, certain qualified business income uh, for pass-throughs would be lowered to 25% uh, as opposed to the individual tax rate of an individual, which is found up above. That qualified business income is basically limited to um, active uh, trades or businesses uh, that are outlined in the code and uh, try to prevent uh, service companies from um, utilizing the active business income to lower their rate. Uh, the Senate goes about this in a completely different way for pass-through entities, and that includes uh, sole proprietorships, uh, S-corporations, and partnerships. They use a, a deduction of 17.4% on qualified business income. In large part, this reaches the same issue, underlying policy issue, which is um, are we talking about active business income here and are we going to give a benefit for it, whether it be a lower tax rate or a deduction that has the effect of a lower tax rate. Um, in computing what business income would be uh, fall into that lower 25% rate, uh, it's an extremely complex calculation that we certainly don't have time to cover today, um, but uh, just so that we're all aware on the phone, it, there will be uh, a lot of uh, digging and, and looking at facts and circumstances uh, in order to make those determinations. So we can move on to the next slide, and we'll just talk about real quickly some of the high-level uh, key items that folks are focusing on right now. One is Expensing is a large one. Um, a few years back, we allowed a 50% expensing for certain property, and we're now moving that up to 100% deduction uh, for a certain property placed uh, in service before 2023. That it would have a very large impact, um, particularly on businesses that are putting property in place that are uh, – you know, in, in have assets, uh, you know, other real property and build buildings, other things that may qualify for certain uh, expensing under these rules. Uh, there's a little di bit difference in the proposals for how these rules would apply. One of them would allow the 100% deduction for assets that go up to five million. That's the Senate proposal, and I'm sorry, the House proposal. The Senate proposal uses a $1 million limit, and that's, that's the extent of the benefit you could get there. As far as interest deductions, uh, we're looking at the business interest income. So they have expense that they want to claim a deduction on. They're allowed to do so to the extent of the income that they receive plus 30% of the adjusted taxable income of such taxpayer. Uh, the House allows any carry forwards uh, to go up to four, five years, and the Senate bill is indefinitely carried forward. NOLs, uh, similar difference between the House and Senate. Um, with both, the NOL carrybacks would be eliminated, and NOLs would be limited to 90% of taxable income. Um, for the Senate, there's an indefinite carry forward period. So once again, they're both uh, similar to the interest in NOLs. As far as the majority of other business tax credits and deductions in the code, they're largely eliminated. And so um, this is a big base broadening effect that it will have. It will reduce rates and pull away a lot of our deductions. That will bring us to our last slide on the just general uh, domestic considerations, um, but that will be felt across the board, and that is um, choice of entity, which was where we started off on. Uh, if you have a, a tax rate of 20% on a corporation, let's say it has $100 of earnings, and uh, $20, $20 goes to pay off that tax, that $80 could be distributed up and taxed at the capital gains rate, assuming that it qualifies under 1H11 uh, or whatever provision is applicable at that time, um, if it's modified, 
but it would be 20% of the 80, which would be about $16. So the total tax rate going from corporate income to individual hands is 36%, which is obviously lower than 39%, uh, which is the highest bracket individuals currently face. And, um, and thus it has this, this effect of essentially making it better for individuals to have their income in corporation, uh, not only just for the rate, but also for the deferral benefits. Uh, the pass-throughs, obviously, they're included immediately. Corporations, they can historically, for foreign, they've been doing this, and they would continue to allow that, uh, that deferral uh, for these U.S. companies as well. Um, DRDs have been reduced slightly. That's a base broadening provision. Uh, it, it's going from 70 and 80 percent to uh, 65 and 50. And another provision that's pretty important in the House has to do with 351 contributions and whether or not they'll qualify as property. Historically, you could contribute property into an entity and not issue stock if you were a sole shareholder. Under the new provision of the code, Section 76, it would require that you issue shares equal to the fair market value of the property contributed in. And this could take away some planning opportunities that involve uh, basis uh, movements and uh, basis spreading, and, um, and there could be uh, other effects as well. Uh, this will obviously impact both partnerships uh, equally, but um, they were never able to benefit from 118. So there's a couple other benefits to deferral, as I mentioned, consolidated returns, tax-free reorgs. But those are the big factors that are in favor of uh, corporate. I'm not going to go into any of the other entities. Uh, we already know the factors to that generally, but I wanted to provide you just an update of these here. So I'll, I'll okay. stop there. Michael. Yeah, th thanks for that, Ben. I'm, obviously, the, the reduction in the federal rate down to 20% has uh, caught a lot of the, the headlines. Uh, it, is, it is matched by some uh, changes to the, the expenses that are uh, allowed. Interesting to see that of the people responding to our polling question, 71% think that it will, be, uh, it will make the U.S. a more attractive place for doing business. Um, but are there any particular sectors that are going to be more favored by these changes, do you think, or, or any sectors that will uh, potentially be disadvantaged by those sectors, or, or are the changes likely to apply relatively equally to, to all sectors in the economy? That's a great question. Well, the, the, one example would be just, say, the real estate industry. So. One big advantage for taxpayers to buy homes is they get to deduct their interest up to a certain amount. Uh, I included a bullet in here about the standard deduction being increased to $24,000 because that's a roughly about what the interest would be on a $500,000 loan uh, for a mortgage. And so the, uh, normally, somebody who would otherwise indivi individually itemize their deductions um, for their home, they now would lose that incentive to do that. And so that could adversely affect the real estate industry somewhat. Um, also, any industries that are, you know, heavily dependent on debt. Uh, and there are lots of industries in that area. Um, when, when I was over at the Senate Finance Committee, uh, we had plenty of people, I mean, throwing fits about that proposal, saying that uh, particularly in, in the foreign context, they just couldn't compete with some of the other countries if this was eliminated because they're, they're able to obtain debt deductions elsewhere and to eliminate them here could, could really cause some serious problems and uh, may make it less attractive for them to, to come here or be, remain here. So those are the two areas I would that come to mind. Oh, that's great. Thanks, Ben. That's a really interesting point you make about <laughs> the, uh, the debt position there. I think we're going to pick up on that later on in the discussion. But also a good opportunity to move now onto the international side of things uh, with Joe Caliano talking us through, together with a side-by-side -side summary, Joe, of the, uh, the two different versions of the reform that are out there at the moment. Yeah, th thanks, Malcolm. And 
some of the biggest changes from a tax reform standpoint are actually happening in the international context. It could really be a significant change to how you tax uh, cross-border cross -border transactions as well as companies. So the first big one is uh, the implementation of a dividend exemption system. And this is really designed to end the lockout effect and encourage U.S. companies to repatriate earnings. There's been a lot of stories out there about companies having billions, if not, tr you know, in the aggregate, trillions of dollars offshore in foreign earnings. This is designed to make it um, more likely for U.S. companies to bring back uh, earnings from offshore. And this would, uh, both the House and the Senate version have this dividend exemption system. It's one of the core components of international tax reform. And it would essentially, under the House version, um, you'll have 100% dividends received deduction for foreign source dividends paid by foreign subsidiaries to 10% uh, corporate shareholders, six-month holding period requirement, no foreign tax credits. The Senate version is very similar to the House version. Um, a one-year holding period requirement there. Uh, little, they also have a little BEPS-type uh, provision in there where no DRD for hybrid-type dividends. So that, this is one of the big um, foundations of international tax reform, allowing those earnings to be repatriated from the foreign subsidiaries back to the U.S. companies without tax. A couple of other things, 956, investment in U.S. property, that would be repealed for corporate shareholders of CFCs. There's also a provision in there limiting losses with respect to certain specified 10% foreign-owned corporations. Basically, they would require you to reduce your basis by exempt dividends that are coming up under the dividend system, but only to calculate your loss. In addition, there's also a provision in there um, for post-2017 foreign branch loss recapture if you have a transfer of substantial all the assets of a foreign branch to a foreign corporation. Next slide. So the uh, so one of the ways that they're helping pay for tax reform is what we'll call a transition tax. And as I mentioned, there's a lot of earnings that you, that are offshore that haven't been repatriated back in the United States. I mean, the number is fairly high. Some would say it's in the trillions. So what this would do is this would provide a significant source of revenue for tax reform. Um, and it's viewed as a necessity to transition from our worldwide tax system, which we've had forever, to a participation exemption or a quasi-territorial system. So what would this require? This would require 10% U.S. shareholders of certain specified foreign corporations to include post-86 historical EMP uh, as of either uh, November 2nd, 2017, or December 31st, 2017, under the House version, whichever is greater. Uh, the mechanism they're using is subpart F, and this requires you to differentiate between EMP that is in cash or cash equivalents or illiquid assets, non-cash assets. So there's a higher rate, a 14% rate under the House version for cash, 7% for non-cash. Um, under the under this uh, transition tax or mandatory deemed repatriation tax, deficits would generally be available to offset your inclusion. Um, there's an election where you could pay it over eight annual installments, and there's special deferral rules for S corporation shareholders. Now this that's the House version. The Senate version of the transition tax is very similar, <clears throat> slightly different testing date as of 11 9 17 or 12 31. Uh, 17, whichever is greater. There, the rates for the cash piece is 10% instead of 14%, and the non-cash piece is 5% instead of 7 under there. Um, similarly, there could be an election to pay over eight installments, but uh, the amount paid would increase over time, the percentage you had to pay. Um, and there's uh, some other special rules, but very similar. The Senate version is very similar to the House version, but one of the biggest differences is some of the uh, the difference in some of the rates with respect to ca ca uh, earnings that are represented by cash or non-cash. So next slide. Some other changes that are coming up 
Indirect foreign tax credits, generally Section 902, which provides for an indirect foreign tax credit, would, would be uh, essentially eliminated, but they would retain 960, uh, Section 960, which allows indirect foreign tax credits on a current year basis. That's for certain subpart F type inclusions. So they, it would be more of a current year basis. Um, sourcing of produced inventory, um, they would change those rules so that it's sourced based solely on jurisdictions of production activities. So, um, you know, the title passage rule with respect to this particular uh, produced inventory would not uh, be relevant in determining the sourcing. Um, some of the significant changes relate to our subpart F rules, our CFC and subpart F rules, but I think it's worth noting at the outset that um, certain subpart F rules do remain in effect. We have certain rules dealing with foreign-based, uh, foreign personal holding company, foreign-based company sales, foreign-based company services. They continue to apply, but there are a number of changes to our CFC rules, our subpart F rules. In some cases, they're expanding the subpart F rules, and others, they're reducing it. I'm not gonna go through all of these, but just to mention a couple, there will be uh, some inflation adjustments for the de minimis rule. The CFC look-through rule, which allows <clears throat> certain CFCs to pay certain types of payments, dividends, interest, rents, royalties, without producing subpart F income under our CFC rules. That would be made permanent. They would, one significant change would be the expansion of the stock attribution rules for determining CFC status. Um, generally, if you have a foreign parent and a U.S. subsidiary, the, the stock owned by the foreign parent generally under our current rules wouldn't be attributed to our U.S. subsidiary. They would change that and therefore expand the scope of entities that potentially could be CFCs and U.S. persons that could be shareholders. Um, they would eliminate the 30-day rule, which is a rule that uh, has been used over the years by certain taxpayers affirmatively. If you have a CFC that's not a CFC for 30 or more days during the year, during the tax year, it's, you could potentially avoid subpart F, so they would eliminate the 30-day rule. Uh, the Senate version uh, modifications are generally similar to the House version. A couple of notable items, they would expand the definition of a U.S. shareholder for CFC purposes to include uh, US, per, U.S. persons that own 10% of the foreign stock by value. Um, let's go to the next slide, intangible income. So with the dividend exemption systems, uh, there might be, an, might encourage companies to move profits offshore. And some of the provisions dealing with intangible income or, 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 or designed to address primarily intangible income, income are designed to remove certain incentives of moving IP offshore by um, taxing certain foreign high returns generally applicable to intangible property and risk. And um, <clears throat> so, so we have two different um, provisions dealing with IP. Um, one is the House version, which would have U.S. shareholders of CFCs, including in gross income for a tax year, an amount equal to 50% of foreign high return amount in a similar manner, uh, similar to the subpart F inclusions. And there's a very complex formula for doing that. But once again, it's, it's focusing primarily on IP type of situations. On the Senate version, you have a very similar provision where you have U.S. shareholders of CFCs would be subject to a current U.S. tax on 50% of what they call global intangible low tax income in a manner similar to subpart F inclusions. Once again, both of these have fairly complex calculations. Um, the, so the 50% uh, guilty deduction would be reduced to 37 and a half for tax years after 1231, 2025. Some other items on the Senate version, there would be a deduction for foreign derived intangible income equal to 37 and a half. Once again, comp there's some complex calculations in here. Uh, foreign derived intangible income Income deduction would be reduced to 21.875 for tax years after uh, 2025. A couple of other items, next slide, um, that deals with intangible income. Um, there are certain rules under the Senate version that would allow CFCs to repatriate IP that's offshore, onshore, without a tax cost. 
to their U.S. shareholders. And there's also some rules dealing with limitations on income shifting through intangible property transfers, including um, a somewhat controversial area. This would treat workforce in place and goodwill and going concern as Section 936H3B intangibles. Next slide. Um, there's a number of um, rules uh, designed to address deductible payments to related foreign affiliates that are, that are seen as eroding the U.S. tax base. Um, the House version, which is a somewhat controversial provision, would impose a 20% excise tax on certain deductible payments with, the, with certain exceptions uh, made by U.S. corporations to related foreign persons unless the foreign uh, company elects to treat the, uh, that, that as effectively connected income in the United States. Um, and this, this provision would generally apply to international financial reporting groups with average annual outbound aggregate payments of at least $100 million. So once again, you see a focus here on certain base erosion payments, trying to carve back those. Now on the Senate side, uh, they have a base erosion tax of 10% on modified taxable income over the regular tax liability reduced by certain credits. So this is almost like a minimum tax type of provision. Once again, the focus of this provision is on certain uh, deductible payments that are being made to foreign persons. It applies to U.S. corporate taxpayers with annual gross receipts of at least $500 million. And there's some special rules on how you calculate that and a base erosion percentage of 4% or more. And the base erosion payments generally are certain deductible payments paid or accrued to a related foreign person. Um, once again, these are designed to get at base erosion payments. Next slide. And I think Ben kind of hit on, um, on on this a little bit. Um, some of these proposals are designed to uh, discourage excess leverage. And I think, Ben, you brought up the proposal uh, which would limit um, your interest deduction to 30 percent of adjusted taxable income with certain exceptions. Um, both in the House and the Senate version, there's additional limitations on interest. Uh, that in the House version, there's a limitation for certain fi international financial reporting groups. And on the Senate side, there would be additional limitations with respect to interest deductions for certain worldwide affiliated groups. Um, so once again, you're seeing a, a theme here where they're looking at trying to claw back or reduce certain deductible payments. Um, there's, a, there's a number of provisions in the House version dealing with possessions, which I'm really not going to discuss at this point. Um, maybe go to the next slide, which um, deals with some additional provisions that are included in the House version. And um, some of these are, are somewhat interesting because we've seen them in, 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 in some different contexts. Um, one is a BEPS-like provision, which would deny certain interest and royalty payments to related parties in hybrid transactions or with hybrid entities. It's worth noting that, um, you know, a couple a couple years back under the Obama administration, there was a very similar type of provision designed to address certain transactions that are hybrid in nature, and we do see this on the Senate side as well. Another one deals with uh, repeal of special rules applicable to DISC and IC DISC. This is uh, a lot of companies have DISC and IC DISC, and it's generally viewed as a, a very favorable benefit. Uh, under the Senate version, there would be a repeal of that. Um, also, there's a rule in the Senate version that would codify Rev Rule 9132, and I'm just briefly mentioning that this really deals with certain when foreign persons sell partnership interests, where they might have a U.S. the partnership may have a U.S. trade or business, it was a highly controversial revenue ruling, and the IRS took the position that when you have capital gain on that sale, the asset that some or all that gain, capital gain could be treated as effectively connected income uh, to the foreign person taxable in the United States uh, because the partnership ha had a U.S. office and a U.S. trade or business. There was recently a case, uh, Grecian Mining, which addressed whether 9132 uh, carried, how much weight 9132 carries. And the court concluded pretty definitively 
for the taxpayer on that, essentially uh, not following 9132 and not treating that gain as U.S. source effectively connected income. They treated that gain as foreign source capital gain not subject to tax. This provision in the Senate bill would codify the IRS's position under 9132. Uh, there's a number of other items in there that, that's in the Senate bill that, um, you know, is in the slides. I'm not, I, I want to be respectful because I know we have a couple things we want to talk about, Monica and Malcolm, on the, some of the planning side here. But these are some of the high-level items that are included on both the House and the Senate version. But what, what you're basically seeing is a move from a worldwide system to a participation exemption, a transition tax to deal with the earnings that have been earned offshore but not repatriated, and certain provisions designed to deal with IP and base erosion. And that's, um, that's the international summary, Malcolm. Right, thanks, Joe. That's, uh, that's really helpful, really informative. Can I just ask you a couple of questions? I mean, uh, one of the things that we saw in some of the early versions, going back six months or so, around U.S. tax reform was um, the idea of a border tax adjustment. Has that been dropped completely from all of these proposals? Um, that's kind of dead. There's other provisions that are designed to deal with base erosion, like we see the unpopular excise tax in the House version and the um, minimum tax uh, in the Senate version. So, yeah, the, the border adjustment tax has been uh, – that, that is no longer being considered as part of tax reform. But with that said, there, there, there are other provisions in both the House and the Senate that are really designed to deal with base erosion, and, um, but the border adjustment tax is no longer being considered. Okay. And you were talking there about the transition tax and um, difference in tax rates for um, uh, cash reserves and non-cash reserves overseas. I, I guess a lot of groups are going to have to uh, get a, a grip on the overseas earnings and profits position in the very near future as a result of that, particularly if they need to account for those taxes uh, for their 31 December year ends. Um, yeah. Is that going to be a big exercise, do you think, for a lot of groups? That is going to be an absolutely huge exercise, Malcolm. It's a great question, um, especially if this legislation gets passed before December 31st in your calendar, your taxpayer. This, for financial statement purposes, this will be a very, very big issue in trying to figure out what your tax liability is going to be. If you have a lot of, let's say you're a U.S. company that has a lot of CFCs offshore, earnings, you're going to really have to pretty quickly figure out <clears throat> what are your earnings and profits offshore um, and what, how much of those earnings are represented by cash or cash equivalents or non-cash, and there is a higher rate uh, under each version, both the House and the Senate bill, for cash. And um, that's an exercise, a modeling exercise, that I think most companies right now are doing or should be doing. Um, probably yesterday, because um, this, as Todd pointed out when he first started, this is moving fairly quickly right now, and there is a possibility that this could be passed by the end of the year. So um, <clears throat> that's probably the item of all of these items I discussed today. That's the one that's probably getting the most attention, because that's where both for tax and financial statements, you're going to have to figure out what your number is. What is the tax going to mean to you? And that is an exercise that um, really uh, you really need to be undertaking uh, now. Okay, that, that's great, Joe. I could ask lots more questions, but I'm very conscious that uh, we've been keeping Monica waiting. So, um, uh, Monica, thank you for your patience. Uh, of course, when looking at the, the, the changes in the U.S., we have to think about them when thinking about the practical implications. We have to think about them in the context of all the other changes that are going on in the world of tax at the moment with BEPS, uh, possible changes through Brexit coming through as well. And we've also got some further consultation out there on the digital economy. Um, but if I were to summarize the main U.S. proposals which are likely to affect international businesses, obviously we've been hearing from Joe there about the reduction in the headline federal rate of tax and the, uh, the introduction of the, the fixed ratio for interest deductions and the transition tax as well, which is applying. From your perspective, Monica, are these the main areas the group should be focusing on? And if so, what should they be thinking about in the context of everything else that's, that's going on in the world of tax? 
Yes, Malcolm, thanks for that. It, lots of good information shared by Ben and Joe in terms of some of the specifics around the proposals. And um, I recognize for the audience it, w it was a lot of information, um, a, a lot of detail, but um, a, as we've talked about, the, the pace of potential change is, is moving very quickly. Um, and between the House and the Senate bill, there are um, you know, important nuances, even Malcolm, to just those three areas that you've laid out in terms of the corporate tax rate, um, interest deductibility, and uh, the, the transition tax and accumulated foreign profits. There, there's very interesting nuances be, between those three pieces. And, and I agree from, from a broad, big picture perspective, those are the items that we would be um, expecting as, as applicable to, to most U.S. groups. But if you think about some of the other important aspects of the proposals, there are, um, there are pieces that, that could have a very wide sweeping business or operational impact really focused around your know, potential for supply chain uh, changes, for example. Um, Joe mentioned um, in the last section about certain types of base erosion payments. Uh, we've, we've, we've heard that theme in Europe for the past few years now around bets. Um, this, this is the U.S. Um, looking at that concept and potentially integrating some of those BEPS-like provisions into our U.S. tax proposals. Um, if we think about those proposals around um, the, the excise tax on cross-border payments or in, in the Senate, um, the, the base erosion um, minimum type tax application, those have the potential for a significant impact to multinationals that have a vertically integrated supply chain. Um, to, to, make it, to make it clear, those, those potential um, base erosion payments would be um, uh, for payments to related parties. So um, under the House bill, just using an example, to the extent a domestic company, a U.S. domestic company, makes a payment to a non-U.S. related party, and there are certain thresholds in terms of the size of the company or the level of the activity, uh, the amount of the intercompany payments, but to the extent that certain types of payments are made to that non-U.S. related party, um, under the House bill, there would be a 20% excise tax applied on that, on that intercompany payment. So if you think about those companies that, that really do operate their businesses very globally, those base erosion type uh, provisions that are in both the House and the Senate proposal, they have much broader implications, much broader than, than just really purely applying to our U.S. domestic companies. So, so to me, I think what you've summarized um, are, are very good takeaways, but um, when we think from a bigger picture perspective um, in, in terms of a, a, a truly globally multinational there, there are many points where this U.S. tax legislation are going to touch um, other jurisdictions. You know, I think, um, you know, Malcolm, we've, um, you know, here on these slides, we've, we've laid out um, what we call, you know, five questions to ask. And I, I think of these questions like a self-assessment uh, that a multinational should be asking um, themselves as we are going through this journey on U.S. tax reform. Uh, we've been in a time of significant change in terms of our global tax landscape. Uh, we all saw the BEPS action points that were released in 2015, and, and many of those changes in light of BEPS have been you know, filtering through uh, tax law changes in, in Europe for the past year. Uh, the U.K. had its this Brexit vote in 2016, um, and now in 2017, we're, we're looking at U.S. tax reform. And you think of the, the coming together of these three you know, extraordinary events uh, and, and the impact they have to a multinational. Um, it, it's really a time where companies need to prepare for that change, um, model it out, and, and execute on any potential steps uh, to optimize their tax posture. So th these questions are um, very high level and um, you know, very general in nature because as, as we've thought about U.S. tax reform, these areas, um, tax profile, just you know, what are the company's tax attributes and, and what is their current tax posture, what, what does their treasury situation look like? As, as Joe mentioned, um, the uh, accumulated earnings transition tax, foreign accumulated earnings transition tax applies differently for cash-type items versus non-cash items. 
So understanding of the, the treasury posture of the company is very important. The supply chain implications as it relates to um, uh, potential for uh, U.S. tax treatment on um, deductible payments, base erosion deductible payments, and, and just the impact that all of that has from an overall global effective tax rate perspective. You could certainly look at that from, from a U.S. tax perspective only for a U.S. multinational, but I, I think our, our premise here is that we're at a place in time where there needs to be a very holistic look by companies at their entire tax posture because of that, because of Brexit, and now because of U.S. tax reform, that, that, that's a lot of moving pieces to look at from a conceptual perspective. The result may not be intuitive to what our historic international tax thinking is around global tax structure. And, um, you know, our second question asks about what should be vetted, all, all of these areas that we've just been talking about. Um, if, if we move on to the next slide, you know, our, our other questions are, are laying out specific attributes that should be reviewed, and these are focused on, on U.S. tax attributes, and then how do we consider those from a planning perspective? So um, th these are five questions, as I said, that we could think of from a multinational's perspective as a, as a self-assessment on, on where we are today on the 30th of November um, in, in light of potential tax reform, but bringing together all the pieces that we've seen from um, an external perspective around global tax change over the past few years. And Monica, you mentioned their supply chain modification. I, th I think in the past we've seen a lot of U.S. groups use structures like uh, offshore principal structures or, or offshore IP ownership, uh, or even um, you know, just uh, limiting the profits in, in other countries with uh, limited risk distribution models, things like that. Is, is all of that now up for uh, review and, and potential change, do you think? Certainly, that, that, that's, up for, that's up for analysis. It's, it's very interesting as a U.S. tax professional to be maybe sitting on, on the other side of the table. Uh, the U.S. historically with a significantly higher uh, federal tax rate than, than the remainder of the world. Uh, you know, we've often thought about supply chain type planning with offshore foreign principal structures um, away from the U.S. But with some of the changes that are being proposed, we anticipate that companies will be thinking and, and reevaluating their structure and, and their overall IP holding as they think about how to, uh, how to potentially adjust their supply chain uh, for, for example, the base erosion payments that I made, uh, made reference to earlier. I, I think that this will be part of an um, overall structure refresh that will be necessary as, as we learn more about the changes from a U.S. perspective. Okay. Now, one of the slightly unusual features, uh, or certainly unusual from looking outside of the U.S. In, into the U.S. tax system, has been the check-the-box rules on entity classification. <laughs> is there any uh, move, do you think, to change any of that in the U.S. with these proposals or at some point in the future, or do you think they're there to stay? Well, as, as we stand, and the current proposals that we've been discussing don't address any um, modification to the existing check-the-box rules, um, and it's you know, very, very commonly discussed outside the U.S. as, as we talk about U.S. tax structuring. Um, it, it's always a, a very interesting mechanism to those outside of the U.S. in terms of how our entity classification selection rules can operate. Under the previous presidential administration, there was some discussion about repeal of uh, check the box rules potentially, but, but nothing as we sit today. Okay. Um, any options available at the moment for immediate planning, do you think, with these rules? Particularly, I'm thinking of the transition tax, where we've got uh, a tax that's going to be based on the amount of um, overseas earnings and profits and different rates for cash versus non-cash. Is there anything the groups can be doing around that now or is it uh, just a case of um, calculating what the tax charge will be once the, uh, the final rates have been set? Mm -hmm. You know, a very good question. I mean, for those groups that have significant um, non-U.S. earnings in, in what are now um, CFCs for U.S. tax purposes, we really should be thinking about quantifying earnings and profits, making sure those numbers are, are very tight in terms of the historic calculations so that there can be appropriate and accurate modeling done as to the impact of the transition tax. 
but also looking at, um, at planning opportunities, such as, for example, accounting method changes that, that may be able to um, make adjustments uh, related to the uh, amount of accumulated earnings um, as of, you know, Joe, Joe, just, Joe described in his section, potential for 1231-17 um, application of that calculation. So looking at accounting method changes that, that may be favorable from an adjustment perspective in those calculations. Okay, well, thank you very much for that, Monica. We've actually had quite a few questions come in, and uh, uh, some of them we've dealt with as we've gone along, but there are a few more, and we will respond to those um, after the, the webinar. So I'd just like to say thanks again to Monica, Todd, Joe, and Ben for uh, guiding us through the, the U.S. reform proposals and where we are in the process. I hope you found it uh, very informative. Thank you very much to everyone for dialing in. We do hold these webinars on a quarterly basis on international attacks, and we will be setting out the timescale for, uh, for the webinars for next year in the near future, so please do look out for those. And uh, thanks again.